tulivyosema wenye walibeba au watu ndio hawakukua na ujuzi wa kutosa kwa sababu mzigo ilikuwa saidi. Wale walikuwa huko watu wote walikuwa watu kumi na sita. Sasa walibaki watu watu saba na watu tisa walisama wote. Very unfortunate indeed. Now, President Huru Kenyatta has warned that some of the remarks by political leaders are likely to plant seeds of discord among Kenyans and plunge the country into chaos. The president has cautioned leaders to watch their utterances and what they say in public, especially to the youth. And speaking from Western Kenya, Deputy President William Ruto and Cod Co-Principal Moses Wetangula expressed optimism that members of the National Assembly and Senate will next week approve the team of 14 that has been nominated to spearhead the Joint Parliamentary Select Committee to resolve the IBC standoff. Sisi kama serikali hatuna headline. Sisi tulisema hii katiba tulitutisha tuifuate. Msitueleze ati twende tuongee mambo ya katiba mstuni. Tuliwaambia twendeni tuongee kule bunge. Na mmekubali sasa sisi tuko na shida gani? Ile tunawaambia tu ni muharakishe. Sisi timu yetu iko tayari. Timu yetu bado iko nusu. Wengine wanasema sijui watakuja, wengine sijui watapaki namna gani. Ili muharakishe. Sisi ni hapa problem. Bora mmekubali twende tuongee in a constitutional manner in institutions set up by the constitution. We have no issue. Mambo yale ambaye tunasikia viongozi wakinena mbele ya watoto yastahili sisi zote tujiulize kama kweli tuataka kujenga Kenya tutaijenga kwa njia ya aina gani na ni watu wa aina gani ambao watatusaidia kuhakikisha ya kwamba hii inchi yetu imeweza kufika kiwango cha maendeleo ambacho kila mkenya atasikia afurahia na ajivunia taifa lake la Kenya. Mimi nataka niwahisi viongozi wa jubilee hasa wajumbe na masenators. Sisi lazima tuwe wale wa mbele mstari wa mbele kulinda ulimi wetu. Lazima tusitimie ulimi wetu kuichoma Kenya. Tusitimie ulimi wetu kugawanya wa Kenya kwa misingi ya kikabila kwa misingi ya mtu mahali ametoka kwa misingi ya dini Meanwhile, court leader Raila Odinga has criticized government, saying it, it has given the cost a raw deal, terming the recent appointments of veteran politicians to parastatal boards as a ridicule. He said that Jubilee's appointment of local leaders into the government was aimed to lure the region to support it in the next polls, but he added that it was too late. Speaking in Rabai constituency, Raila reiterated his claims that colossal sum of the loans the government has acquired had been stolen. Raila said that the debt burden has ballooned under the Jubilee regime and it had failed to mitigate economic hardship facing Kenyans, adding that prices of essential goods had soared. Akija karibu na mnai ananaswa. Kwe kwe kwe. Sasa ni mnaona leo kazungu kambo imepewa zii chema na nini? Kadhana ngara chema ni nini? Ai yote ni makombo. Now, the repatriation exercise of refugees from the Dadaab camp is on the right track. That is the message coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which says that already 1,000 Somali refugees have voluntarily left the camp in an exercise meant to close the 25-year-old refugee fortress. But is this an exercise in futility? Are the refugees willing to go back? Katie's Timothy Otieno explores. The camp housing close to half a million refugees could soon be no more. 
A government directive issued in May 2016 could see that by the end of this year alone, nearly 150,000 refugees are repatriated back to Somalia, a country still grappling with the Al-Shabaab menace. But according to government officials, the repatriation exercise couldn't be going any smoother. During a press conference in Nairobi Saturday evening, Foreign Affairs Cabinet Secretary Amina Mohamed expresses confidence that the camp's end is imminent. The return and the reintegration process, which has seen the return of more than 16,000 refugees to date, will be implemented with the continued support of the governments of both the Republic of Kenya and the Federal Republic of Somalia. Over and above that, the ministry quotes that a November 2013 tripartite agreement between Kenya, Somalia and the UN Refugee Agency has already seen the number of Somali refugees registered in Dadaab decrease by nearly 100,000. It is something that I've been calling, we've been calling the unpacking of Dadaab. The unpacking of a camp crowded by many whom have known no other home except Kenya for the last 25 years. A quarter of a century in which the Kenyan government now believes is long enough to rehabilitate fleeing Somalis. The main reason, however, for the closure attributed to the increasing number of terror attacks that have plagued the nation, resulting in the death of nearly 500 innocent Kenyans in a span of just three years. And I don't think as a country we owe it to, to anyone to continue justifying why we are taking this action. 25 years is a long time. Nobody wants to be a refugee for a day. And we are glad to the uh, uh, incognizant of the progress we are making. International organs have already pronounced themselves on the matter, with Amnesty International calling the proposed closure a reckless decision. But on the ground, there's little evidence of a sense of willingness to voluntarily go back to a place with an uncertain future. Despite the government's seemingly undying drive to have the Dadaab refugee camp host no one else by the end of 2018. Timothy Otieno, KTN News. Now, the decision by Britons to exit from the 28-member European Union is an exercise that might have caught many by surprise worldwide. However, what seems to have caught more shock to many is perhaps UK Prime Minister David Cameron's move to resign in circumstances that ordinarily did not warrant the same. Was the referendum loss an indictment on him as a leader of a government, or was it purely a matter of principle and honor in leadership? A senior political affairs reporter, Duncan Kayemba, puts the matter into perspective. 23rd June 2016 referendum exercise in the United Kingdom will go down in the annals of history as a democratic exercise too close to call that seemingly threw the entire globe into a spin as Britain, which is Kenya's colonial master, voted narrowly to exit from the European Union, the EU. An outcome that might have come as a shocker to the leader of government, Prime Minister David Cameron, who announced his resignation immediately. The British people have made a very clear decision to take a different path. And as such, I think the country requires fresh leadership to take it in this direction. For those for or against the UK in the 28-member union were nearly at par, with those for exit polling 52%, Whereas those who felt they should remain in the EU were 48 percent, a clear indication that there were no outright winners. But nonetheless, for Cameron, he opted to resign in what many pundits say it's honor in leadership, and that he could have interpreted his defeat in rallying UK citizens to remain in the EU as a vote of no confidence in his leadership. The outcome of the UK referendum paints a more or less similar picture on events closer home. In 2005, Kenya conducted a plebiscite on the then proposed new constitution, an exercise that fronted high stakes, dividing the then NAC regime into two on whether to vote for or against the proposed constitution. 
At the end of the day, the renegade members of the cabinet, led by then Minister Zraila Odinga, Kalonzo Msioka and Najib Balala, who had teamed up with opposition leader Uhuru Kenyatta, now president, handed President Mwai Kibaki, who led the yes team, a resounding defeat. Imeonyesha wazi kwamba wanainchi wengi wameipinga katiba iliopendekezwa. But unlike Cameron who opted to resign, the then president responded resoundingly as well by sacking his entire cabinet two days later. Wamuzi huo sasa umefanywa. Whereas in well-grounded democracies, leaders step down in honor of the office they hold in Africa, Kenya for instance, those implicated in various scams declare war literally instead. If that is a committee or that is a type of justice I'm going to receive as a resignation, then I would rather die than resign. I am not resigning. I have committed no crime. The latest being the embattled IBC chairman Isaac Hassan, implicated in a BVR kit scam with partners in London who have since been convicted. Serious of doubt, the commissioners are not resigning. But Cameron's action does not touch those in government alone. For example, in the US, whenever an individual runs for a political office and fails to be elected, they never give another try. In the year 2000, and then U.S. Vice President Al Gore, a Democrat, lost to the opposition candidate George W. Bush. Same case to John McCain and Mitt Romney, Republicans who are floored by current U.S. President Barack Obama and have never thrown their hats in the ring again. Duncan Hemba, KTN News. Now the following story will leave your tongue wagging. A primary school in Mandy County has over 10 girls in class 6 and 7 pregnant. Parents of Pemja Primary School together with the administration are wondering who could be responsible for the pregnancies. Is it the teachers or fellow pupils? A North Rift reporter Elvis Kosgay visited the school and sought answers to this problem that has left the academic future of the girls in a limbo. The steep hill and the rough terrain that surrounds Cheberen village depicts the magnitude of the matter at hand of a school in Nandi County. <laughs> Pemja's school motto, Life is a Struggle, mirrors the life that pupils undergo in their quest for education. The state of the classroom gives a vivid description of an institution that has endured years of poor infrastructure following its establishment in 1977. Mad world and windowless classroom is just but a tip of the iceberg. There is more than meets the eye. Hakuna kuwaribu maneno ama mtengeneza. Chenye situ nasema tu, uwewe kama chairman. Bile hii maneno lianza buwana, uzimeke on. Haa, hiko on, hiko on. Kwanza inamulika, angekua natumulika kwanzia mbele, hezi mulika kwanzia. That aside, the school harbors 11 pregnant girls aged between 12 to 16, an incident that has sent shockwaves among parents and school management to an extent. Most of them prefer silence over the matter. Mambo ingine unasigia na kama kuongesa chumbi na hiyo siyo msuri. Hata mimi siwesi na kaongesia Kenya msima chumbi. Hiyo siyo msuri. But our persistent efforts to unravel the truth bore fruits. Despite conflicting reports from the teacher, and the school chairman. Tuluweza kuwa na shida wa sichana. Wa sichana tisa walipima. Waka patikana na mimba. Hii watoto kama ni mingi sana ni safa. Na hata ukichungusa hata maafisa ambayo watatua report. Utapata kwamba hawa watoto naesa kuwa safa au tano. But how could such an incident happen without the knowledge of the school management and parents? Ya kwansa wa sichana wengi walikuwa na lalameka kila mara wakisema kichwa inaniuma kichwa inaniuma tunawatuma hospitali uh, ukonjwa ina ICT na sita mpaka sasa tukatumana kwa daktari kawaida huwa ni routine kwa so, sababu this environment iko kando sana it's unlike any other environment in our father probe we caught up with one of the aggrieved parents whose fourth born is among the girls who are said to be pregnant he maintained the number is even more than what we think 
huyo msichana anatembea na huyu msichana mimi nasikia yeye na amesema huyu msichana wangu amesema mtoto wangu amesema ako standard teeth na huyo friend wake tafadhali sasa huyo kaitemen ingetoka kwa shule sababu hii friendship inatoka kwa shule as to who is responsible for the pregnancy is born of contention with the institution absolving itself from it sasa nao sasa singine wanatoa petition kwa watoto na information na tuweza pata information kwa wasasi unapata tu mtoto leo ni absent kesho ni absent kufanya follow up unafanya follow up mtoto anarudi shuleni unaona mwili wa mtoto si ya kawaida Elvis Kosgay KT News Cheberen Village Inandi County Indeed a very worrying trend there now the Maasai for many centuries hunted and killed lions as a traditional rite of passage to manhood. Lion killing was to express bravery, identify leaders and impress women. And the more the warriors, the less the lions became. But the Maasai community working with the Big Life Foundation created a historic alternative to lion killing. The Maasai Olympics, as national athletes prepare for the Rio Olympics, Maasai Morans are gearing up for the finals of the third Maasai Olympics. Take a look. There is a saying that when a Maasai Moran jumps, he rises with the wind and the grounds wait for him to stand again. <laughs> but this isn't just another signature Maasai jump. It's a competition of athletes for a feat that started in 2012, held after every two years, the Maasai Olympics. The Menye Layok, or Cultural Fathers, partnered with the Big Life Foundation and organized the Maasai sports competition based upon traditional warrior skills. <laughs> So instead of killing lions to prove their manhood, gain recognition, express their bravery or impress the women, the warriors engage in their sportsmanship. At local level, they receive training in six events, the 800 meters run, 5,000 kilometers run, 200 meters sprint, javelin, the high jump, and rungu throwing for accuracy. They are selected to one to four teams across the Amboseli Tsavo ecosystem. It will represent a warrior manyata or village that will host almost 4,000 young men during their 12 to 15 years of warriorhood. The regional level culminates the ecosystem-wide event in December. And just like the Olympics, the warriors will receive grand prizes such as medals and prized bulls. <laughs> In its close to four years, the lions in this ecosystem have increased in number, estimated from 40 to more than 100, an affirmation that the Maasai community cares deeply for conservation and does not have to leave its culture behind. David Rudisha, the world's 800 meter current Olympic champion and world record holder, is the Maasai Olympics patron. Who knows, another Maasai warrior could in the future replicate his feats. Dorka Swangira, KTN News. Right, right now we want to take a short break here on Weekend Express. Don't go too far. We'll be back with more news. Welcome back and thank you for staying with Weekend Express. Of course, we do apologize for a technical hitch that we had that uh, had us take that short break, but we are back and let's continue with the news. And a uh, time now for Daring Abroad, uh, the series about Kenyans in the diaspora. And uh, this morning, our special correspondent, Alex Chamwada, talks to an online journalist in London, Peter Njiri. Njiri narrates the ups and downs Kenyans in the diaspora go through from his first-hand experience. Take a look. He 
came to the UK when immigration rules were not as tough as they are today. Peter Njiri Karanja is one of the Kenyans living in London with a wealth of knowledge about the welfare of the Kenyan community here from first-hand experience. From the train, we drive to his house in East London. Mr. Because when I came here in the early 90s, I was telling Kenyan community here that we are in a foreign country and whatever you are doing in life, you are sowing a seed. So you should be careful of the seed you are sowing. In the year 2000, Peter shot to fame after launching a website under his nickname, Mr. Seed. The website informs the Kenyan community on what is happening in the diaspora. My intention at the very beginning was just to bring a simple thing forward where people in the community can know what's happening within the community around. Because now, depending on British newspapers and magazines and radio and TV, it was not serving the purpose. So I found there was a gap. The website became a hit because of its human interest content. The website, Lovely, today has got a, a leadership of half a million people a day. There are so many issues happening with the community. Who is the new High Commissioner? What's happening with the High Commission? Who has passed away? Who is wedding? Who is, who is coming from Kenya? Which bank is coming to UK? His main source of news is the Kenyan community itself. We have a big section for obituaries. Let's say somebody has lost a parent here or back home or even somebody have passed away. I'm the first contact. They link me, we have lost this and that, this and that, and we need help because as you know, traditionally our communities, they gather together to bring funds together to do the job. When they say it's a business or some companies are coming from Kenya, I'm like the first contact here in the UK. They tell me I'm, like, the, the banks, they want to come and do road shows, and they contact me then so that I can be able to inform the community. We have quite a number of advertisements from banks, from community, from travel agents, from money transfers. He calls the website a big forest of fruits, meaning there are lots of negative and positive stories. One of the major issues is about the deportation. You know, people when they come here, they come through for green pastures and things sometimes doesn't work their way. And sometimes they are into big, being in detention or uh, having a big problem and they need a lawyer and the community we put up in the website that we need to come together to help one of our own who is in problems. One of the uplifting stories that pulled traffic on his website, he says, was that of the election of Elizabeth Kangede as a councillor in East London, who later held the position of mayor of Barking and Dagenham for one year between 2014 and 2015. Councillor Elizabeth is a Kenyan born in Kiambu County, a teacher by training. We are all excited to see one of our own making up it abroad. Some articles on the website have landed Mr. Seed in trouble over defamation claims. Yes, I have, I have a case, one or two, whereby we have been taken to court by some Kenyans. Mr. Seed is married to Jane, a pastor. They have five children and five grandchildren. His firstborn is 37 years old. His lastborn is 27. I'm a grandchild to Chief Jiri, you know, the one who was named after Jiri High School. We come from the slopes of Abadeas, Moranga. Life can be expensive abroad, he says. You can be having a lot of money, but the system itself, you see the money you get, they all go back to go to the same place. You know, there are bills, heavy bills here. There are a lot of licenses to pay. There are many taxes. The taxation here is very, very high. It's unfortunate that today we have quite a number of relatives and families and parents who are in court with the people living in the diaspora. This is because they, we, we respected them, they sent the money to them to do something for them. For them, they see that it's money which has got here, they got here easily. Some even going to an extent of that, they, let's say you are constructing a house, they take a photograph of a neighbor's house and they send you the photo that your construction still, we need more money because now we are doing the rental. Little do you know that he has not even bought the plot. 
Mr. Seed has invested in property in the UK. All his children work here, but all said and done, he says, his heart is at home. Today I'm heading to 60 now. I'm few minutes, few months to 60 years. Watoto wangu wote wanajua Kikuyu, Kiswahili, 